Yes, we are live, finally, after a, a lot of mucking about with Google. Um, we are on the air. This is a uh, so, sort of a tete-a-tete -tete kind of thing. Patrick Wyman and I are going to be talking about prospects and MMA. It's something that recently I've been doing a lot more work on, I, you know, apart from my Welcome to the UFC series, which tends to look at guys right when they've crossed over from that prospect mark to somebody that we're actually going to be watching a lot regularly in the UFC. I've been starting to look more and more at guys when they are still on the regional level, so I figured we'd pull Pat in here and talk a little bit about just what the prospect development process looks like, what you know, what we're out there looking at when we're looking at film and sort of the expectations you get and sometimes what it means when guys fail to meet those expectations or when they, you know, exceed them. And so we just want to, you know, there's a lot of stuff to cover here. We got a lot of questions, too, from people that we want to talk about. And, uh, you know, it's just a, uh, it's a good... It's a good thing to look at in the current MMA climate when the UFC is signing every single guy on the face of the planet, whether they're ready or not, whether they're a prospect or not. And it's really hard to tell uh, who, you know, who, who's, re who's a re somebody you should really be paying attention to and who isn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, Patrick, thanks for being in here. Oh, thanks very much for having me. I mean, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, no matter what, no matter what sport you're talking about, prospect uh, like prospects are, are an inherently uncertain thing. And you know, no matter how detailed a process you develop, no matter how much, re no matter how much research you do, um, you know, you, there are always going to be there are always going to be guys that you just completely miss on, and there are going to be guys who come out of absolutely nowhere. I mean, now, by and large, there are still, but by and large, there are still factors that that tend to point strongly in one direction or another. I mean, if you have uh, if you have a guy who trains at a big camp, that's a massive, massive plus. Guys, guys who fit that profile are about three times as likely in the sample that I looked at. I looked at a sample of, uh, of about 180 fighters. Uh, it are about three times as likely to make it to the UFC and to be successful once they're there. Um, and, you know, like, whether that's a self-selection thing from matchmakers and promoters because they're just more likely to find, they're just more likely to find those guys in the first place, um, or whether it's because you really do get a massive kind of network effect benefit from training at a, from training at a big camp, uh, you know, you get the benefits of those training partners and coaches and, uh, uh and the expo, and the exposure and, and all of that good stuff, um. You know, I think it's I think it's a combination of those two things. Uh, but uh, but you know, regardless of the actual causality, there the patterns uh, the patterns pretty clear. Yeah, um, well, and partially too, it can always be that camps are finally starting to scout athletes. You know, that they're starting to look for particular guys to bring in and build up, rather than just ch taking whoever shows up at the gym. Well, yeah, and a lot, and, and you know what ha what seems to be happening a lot of the time is you bring a guy in to you bring a guy in for uh, for another fighter's camp to, to to work as a training partner, and the guy just ends up sticking around. Yeah, uh, like like Rashid Magomedov uh, for his first UFC fight went down to or went uh, went from Russia to Team Takedown uh, to work with Johnny Hendricks and to simulate Robbie Lawler for Johnny Hendricks, and then he did I think his next camp there, and then went to ATT after that, but. So, but bringing guys in, to, but bringing guys in to work as training partners and sparring partners, um, is is one big route. That's how I, I'm pretty sure that's how Miles Jury ended up at Alliance. Was he had come in to he had come in to work at somebody's camp, um, you know. That is so so that's one mechanism by which uh, by which that happens. I, I gotta say too though that the idea of bringing in Rashid Mago or Magomedov to uh, mimic Robbie Lawler was really that's like awesome preparation right there. Well, yeah, I mean, but that's that's Stephen Wright, you know. Uh, Stephen yeah. Wright, uh, in case you don't know him, head kick, uh, head striking coach at Team Takedown. Uh, really, like in a sport where being a film where being a film junkie coach is becoming a bigger and bigger deal, like we see that with Dwayne Ludwig. Steve, Stephen Wright is the ultimate ultimate film junkie. He watches everything. He watches every kick every major kickboxing fight, every major boxing match, uh, pretty much every MMA fight. He watches everything. And so, if anybody was going to be able to pluck, you know, Rashid Magomedov from obscurity to come to come work with uh, Johnny Hendricks, it was going to be Stephen Wright. 
Yeah, that's, I mean, and Magomedov is one of those guys that, I mean, I, he certainly didn't, I think he didn't get nearly that much hype coming out of the regional scene of Russia as some of the other guys have now. That that whole area is becoming a place that people are looking to constantly for prospects. Mm-hmm. But he's certainly somebody, I think, that's exceed. well, he has, and it's weird because, I mean, I guess he hasn't really exceeded expectations, but he's very quietly becoming a very good fighter. Yeah, I mean he is he is just absolutely rock solid. He is uh, I mean they were ta- I mean I think it was Stephen Wright who was talking about this about putting him in uh, about putting him in grappling in in grappling sessions with Johnny Hendricks and Hendricks couldn't hold him down and similar reports from ATT that you know guys like guys like Tiago Alves and Glayson Tebow can't can't hold Rashid Magomedov down um, and can't can't get him down in the first place and can't hold him down even when they start there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean he's he's becoming a very good fighter, you know, found, founding member of the North Caucasus NAP squad. Uh, big big fan, big fan of his yeah. game. He's he's got a fight schedule, doesn't he? He's he's coming up shortly. Yeah, I can't. I'm trying to think who he's fighting now. Let me see. Um, let's, see let's bring this up. But um, uh, so as much as we're talking, you know, I t- bring up uh, he's fighting Elias Silveria, which I'm um, that fight just. Excites me in so many ways. Yeah, that's that's an awesome fight, an awesome fight. I mean, we should be stoked about that. That's like that's one of those matchups that's gonna fly under the radar until about two days before the fight, or until about two days before the card, and then people are gonna be like, oh, oh, well, well played, Joe Silva, well played. Yeah. I mean, it, it's two awesome and totally different technical strikers facing off against each other. So it's definitely something to look forward to. But so we, you know, talking about a couple successful guys. I, I think the big thing I wanted to look at was maybe some of the guys that we've talked about lately who haven't been so successful and how that really should be tell, giving us a better narrative on prospect development. Uh, so a couple of guys you scouted heavily were uh, Yosdenis Cedeno and Mike Rhodes, and they have both had a really rough run in the UFC. Yeah, I mean, it, in Cedeno's case... And because we've we've talked, we were talking about Cedeno on on Twitter right in the aftermath, of, or right in the aftermath of that uh, of his performance last Saturday. Like in Cedeno's case, it's it's as simple as he had a, he had a terrible process. His process was bad, and he coasted on his physical tools through the region uh, through the regional scene. And I mean, he's effectively the same fighter as he was two years ago when he was on the regional scene. I mean. Yeah. Somebody who relied almost exclusively on his, un- I mean, in fairness, his unreal athleticism to defend takedowns rather than any sort of ring craft or really particularly well-developed takedown defense. Um, you know, on the feet, he relied exclusively on his speed and power rather than, rather than you know, proper setups. Like, and, you know, the, the metagame of, of modern MMA is just not forgiving for guys who may have that kind of enormous one-punch knockout power uh, and, and ridiculous athleticism if they can't throw enough to convince the judges that they're winning the fight. Like Yeah, well, especially, I mean, you look at the two guys that have beat him now in the UFC, Chad LaPreece and Ernest Chavez, mm-hmm. and they're basically the same fighter, and they're this incredibly generic class of UFC fighter yes. that can easily take wins from guys like Cedeno who have a ton of athletic tools but very few developed skills. Yeah. It's that sort of hard-headed, constant output, bo- low-power boxer. Yeah, and I mean, and I think, in, in fairness to Lopriz, I think Lopriz is going to end up being pretty good. Um, I think he's I think he's a much more athletic, kind of Sam Stout, Mark Hominick-esque fighter, which makes sense because he's trained a lot with those guys. Like, and and now that he's uh, and now that he's a tri-star, obviously we saw his we saw his wrestling make some make some pretty substantial strides. But I mean, but yeah, I mean, Ernest Chavez has almost nothing going for him aside from his durability and his output. And so, yeah. you know, he had he had some rough moments in that fight where he ate some big shots from Cedeno, but partially because it was short notice and partially because that's just the fighter that Cedeno is, he was able to kind of weather the storm and work some top control and outwork him with, like, really kind of crappy low kicks. Low kicks and, and like, a not-sharp jab. And, you know, at, like, as much as it may suck because you don't want to score those things, as you don't want to score those things particularly heavily, if the other guy is doing nothing, which is what Cedeno was doing, you have to score it for him. Yeah. Like, and, you know, that's... But but with Cedeno, now that he's at the Black Zillions, I mean, what do you, what do you think he can do? Do you think Henry Hoof can fix him, Zane? 
I I hope so. I think if anybody can right now, from a technical, purely technical building standpoint, Henry Hooft is the guy. I mean, the late career progress he's been able to make with Anthony Johnson has been astounding. Like, that's that's you know a guy who was just sort of fighting at this really generic UFC kickboxer level with a shitload of athleticism and power and who suddenly came to Black Zillions and within like a couple of years has become one of the game's most technical kickboxers. So yeah, and I mean you can and you can see with Hooft, Hooft is fine with a with a total with a total tear down rebuilding job because yeah. you can see I mean I I think if if you want to if you want to not give up on Yosdenis Sedeño the, the the parallel would be Michael Johnson, a guy who had fantastic physical tools, great athleticism, great speed, great size, great size for the division, um, but who was just who was relying purely on his athleticism. Like in no universe should Jonathan Brookins, who's now fighting at who's now fighting at bantamweight or flyweight, have been able to repeatedly take down and outvolume Michael Johnson on the feet, and that's how that's how he won that fight. And yeah. like and now. You know, there were some rough time, there were some rough moments on the way up, like the uh, 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 the fight with Reza Madadi where Johnson yeah. got taken down a got taken down a bunch of times, and you could see that was the rebuilding job in like that was the rebuilding job happening in front of our eyes because Johnson's striking looked better, but he had no idea where his hips were or how or, or how far onto him Madadi was, and so he just got taken down a bunch of times and eventually choked out. Yeah, or you can, I mean, even for another guy who's about in the same place as Cedeno in the division right now, you can even look at somebody like Gilbert Burns. Yeah. Training mm -hmm. out of the Black Zillions. And you can see that this is somebody who is being taught striking fundamentals at the very basic level and just being built slowly with that, you know? Yeah. He started out as a great BJJ player and is slowly becoming a technical kickboxer. Yeah, I mean, you watch, I, I actually just went back to watch this the other day, but uh, Gilbert Durino's debut against Andreas Stahl. Stahl has been in the game for, I think, three years longer than Burns has, and, he, and Stahl has good striking coaches and, and is really a pretty, uh, by the standards of somebody who's making his UFC debut and considering the fact that he was a wrestler to start with, Stahl is a pretty polished striker, and Burns was, and Burns was, able, to, and Burns was able to put a beating on him. I mean, yeah. he landed a lot of hard shots, and it was a close fight, but it was still a fight that, I mean, I thought Burns won pretty clearly. But you can see, too, if you, you know, just watch a YouTube video of, of Henry Hooft holding pads for somebody. And watch the kind of advice he's giving and watch the, watch, watch the subtle movements, the way that he forces his fighters to, to the way he, uh, he makes himself not a, not a stationary target. Like, that's a huge pet peeve when you see, when you see a striking coach working. as a guy who's just standing in place. Like, yeah. he makes his fighters move. And get used to and get used to keeping their feet under them as they throw those kinds of uh, those kinds of technical basics that uh, that are that are way uh, that are way harder to find in MMA than they uh, than they really should be. So um, you know, Sedano obviously we, we're talking about a fighter that's just come to a, a big camp and is now looks like he's being torn down and rebuilt from the ground up. Maybe that's successful. Maybe that's not. But um, Mike Rhodes is somebody who's now been with a decent big camp for a while, and that process seems to be at something of a standstill. What do you, I mean, what do you think's going on there? Do you think that's just a case of too much too soon and a much longer process than fans want to admit, or is that something that's particular to the fighter? I mean, I think in, in Rhodes's case, I think he is the poster child for why you don't necessarily take a UFC off for the first time it shows up. I mean, he got his debut against George Sullivan on nine days' notice, and he was and he was he had he had just fought like a month and a half before, and it, and it, it, Christmas had come and gone, and he didn't have a fight scheduled, and so you know he got it, it, and Rhodes is a big dude. Rhodes is a really big dude. He walks around at two o at two o five or so and makes the cut to welterweight, um, and so you it, like he was not in the kind of shape he needed to be on nine days uh, on nine days' notice. Uh, so there, so there's that basic, there's that basic facet. But then the second part of it is he was just way too raw to start with. I mean, you, especially with guys who don't come in with a defined base. Like um, I'm trying to think of who would be uh, who would be another good example of this off the top of my head. 
Um, I think I think you saw this in Mirsad Bektik's debut too. Mm-hmm. Guys who don't come in, guys who don't have a skill set that they can fall back on, whether that's whether that's boxing or, or kickboxing or wrestling or jujitsu, who don't have some defined thing that in their back pocket where you know even if everything else goes wrong, at least I can spam takedowns. Um, what you what you tend to see, and you saw this really clearly in the third round with Mike Rhodes, was he just kind of ran out of ideas. Like yeah. you know, when you only when you only really know three different two or three different takedowns, and you don't know a whole bunch of different entries for your takedowns, and as a striker, you know, Rhodes Rhodes has a real nice right hand, uh, a nice uh, a, a nice jab, and a nice and and some nice uh, and, and some nice high kicks off both legs. But like when you only have a, a really limited number of things that you know how to do, um, you know, you're gonna and you're fighting a veteran dude like Sullivan. Sullivan's you know Sullivan that was his. That was Sullivan's 18th fight. Uh, he'd been in the game for five or six years. Like that guy had seen everything that you could see on the regional scene. Um, and it turns out Sullivan's not a bad fighter either. Yeah, like, I mean I Sullivan's mean, a guy who's kind of crafty beyond his beyond his experience. Even mm-hmm. like he he fights at a much higher level. I mean that's he's sort of the case for an overperforming prospect, somebody that you look mm-hmm. at on the regional scene. And you're like, oh yeah, he looks okay, and who's then come in and been a much better fighter than expected. Yeah, I mean, prior to prior to Ernest Chavez getting finished in both of his last two fights, you could have said the same thing about Ernest Chavez. But you know, but leaving leaving that aside, keeping it on Sullivan. Yeah, I mean, like a guy like Sullivan who can just who's just going to come in and he's going to outwork you. That's what he's going to do. I mean, he's he's huge for the weight class. I bet Sullivan walks around at two at two hundred two hundred and ten pounds in between his camps. He's enormous. Yeah. Um, he's he's got unbelievable conditioning for a guy who cuts uh, for a guy who cuts that much weight. Who knows all of the who knows all of those little veteran tricks. Who's who's been in rough spots. Who's had who's had really hard fights. Um, like who, who has uh, who has cornermen who have been in those kinds of fights too and know how to bring him back. Um, you know those are the kinds of guys that we see uh, that we see overperform. They're guys who can push a pace. Like Neil Magny too. I mean Neil yeah. Magny I think is a much more promising prospect over the long run than. Than George Sullivan is, but but you see that with Magny, a guy who's just you can you can win fights by spamming uh, by spamming a jab and by keeping a pace on. Mm-hmm. That's very true. So with Rhodes, I mean, do you think he gets like do you think we're on a trajectory to see him still built into a very good prospect, or has that just been like has is the speed bump big enough to just knock him down a ways? I I think he can come back and and be just fine. He's uh, he's hurt right now. Mm-hmm. Um, he's actually just he's actually just getting back uh, he's actually just getting back to training. Um, you know, I think that there are a lot of guys out there that he can still beat. I mean, I think you put him in there with Gasan Umulatov, <laughs> and I think Rhodes wins that fight. Um, you know, who's uh, who's another bottom of the barrel welterweight? I think he can beat Igor Araujo. Uh, yeah. You know, I think that like if you give him a kind of a gimme in his next fight, and I hope that Joe Silva does because Rhodes is a guy who really could develop into kind of a a top fifteen ish kind of fighter. I mean, I think we still need to like temper our expectations at this point because he did lose two in a row, and guys you know, like guys who are going to rise into the top five or top ten are not going to lose two fights in a row against George Sullivan and and Robert Whitaker, regardless of the circumstances. Yeah, or the, if they do lose those kind of fights, they tend to be fluky losses where it's or you know it's like either an injury or you see a lot of subs early in a hot prospect. You can see a guy get you know choked out or arm barred two or three times or something early on in his career and yeah. then after that they just move you know power through dudes yeah i would i would say you know the the the, the submission thing is a really interesting point because we do see a lot of guys who go on to be very very good with like a couple of really incongruous submission losses yeah um, like like anderson silva is the prototypical example of that oh like, yeah I mean, oh, Jose Aldo and Junior Dos Santos. I mean, it's really typical. Yeah. Oh, I mean, Conor McGregor getting uh, getting beaten. Was it was it Artem Lobov, the prospect yeah. killer, uh, and uh, and and Joe Duffy. And Joe Duffy's a, a fine fighter. Lobov really is not is, is no. not good at all. I mean, by by any sort of reasonable uh, any sort of reasonable standard. I mean, like he's. You know he's a solid regional journeyman, but he's not the kind of guy that you expect to that you expect to submit a future a future champion. Yeah, well, I'm mean, like even right now, there's a guy that I've been scouting, and I'm you know you've been scouting him too, I'm sure. Uh, 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 Umar or what's he? Kamaru. Uh, oh, uh, Kamaru Usman. Yeah. Yeah, Kamaru Usman. Uh, 
And he's got a submission loss to, I think it's Frankie Perez mm. now. Uh, it's like second pro fight. And Perez is a really solid uh, sort of journeyman of that East Coast um, fight system, the same th- system that produced Sullivan. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he's not a guy that you're going to watch and go like, oh, he's the next top big thing in the sport. But it is the kind of guy that somebody like Usman, you know, that's a, that that kind of early career loss is pretty typical. Oh, yeah, you see um, another, another good example. I, I don't know if you've gotten around to watching film on him yet, but uh, Tom Duquenois. Uh, who's the who's the who's fighting in Bama now? Uh, yeah. Had a had a loss to a had a loss to a dude, and I think he was uh, had a like a really weird kind of out of nowhere submission loss. Like they were like they were scrambling, guy locked up like a Darce or an Anaconda or something like that, and squeezed and put Duke and Watt to sleep before before he could even tap. And I think like especially with these really young hyper athletic dudes who think they can just scramble their way out of anything like Conor McGregor is a perfect example of that you look at his grab you look at his grappling earlier in his career not particularly technical at all and really just relied on his physical tools and when you run into somebody who or when you run into somebody who has either a sounder technical grappling base or just happens to get lucky and lock something up in transition it's no different than getting hit with like a super lucky knockout punch yeah but but it seems to happen to these like really hyper athletic, inexperienced prospects with with some regularity. Yeah, it does. It is something that you know. I think you can you can look at when because a lot of a lot of for a lot of people, prospect watching is really just sort of the Wikipedia level, mm-hmm. sure dog database wins and losses. And there, but there are certain definitely certain loss patterns that you can look at and. You know, you you that aren't even necessary. Like I say, they might even be a positive. It's something you look at it and you're like, oh, you know, I see he lost in his fourth pro fight by submission to some nobody. That actually might, and then hasn't lost since. That might actually be a pretty good sign. Yeah, and I mean, I know when I'm evaluating prospects, I don't weigh that particularly heavily at all. I mean, yeah. like, I don't. A guy doesn't have to be a guy doesn't have to be undefeated for me to for me to think like for me to think like this guy is worth worth the time to look at. I mean, if anything, I <clears throat> unless it's like a kind of a we- unless it's kind of a controversial thing, like I tend to I tend to weigh decision losses much more heavily than I would a submission loss. Mm-hmm. So a submission loss or like a really strange kind of knockout loss like uh, like Jim a- Jim Ayler's uh, yeah. who who got signed to the UFC had like a really weird fluky knockout loss in like 27 seconds. And it doesn't mean that his chin sucks, nothing like that, but he just kind of got clocked out of nowhere by this dude. But a decision loss, to me, that means that there's usually something fundamentally wrong with a guy's process, and that's something that I would weigh, that's something that I would weigh more heavily. Definitely, definitely. So to that point, I think we should get to some of these questions. We've got like a half a hundred here to uh, work on, and I think the, one of the big ones that struck me r- right away was... Uh, somebody asking or suggesting, like, what what do we think? Like, how do where are we going to get heavyweights? How do we dig up heavyweights? Mm-hmm. And, and, and you know, how could we fix the process of getting heavyweights? And this has actually become sort of a pet peeve of mine, not because I want to argue that heavyweight is especially good, but I do think that it's basically always functional. It's not nearly the terrible division that people think it is. If that from makes a, sense, from a prospect perspective, or just as a division in general. Well, as from a prospect perspective, in 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 the way in the in the sense that it develops prospects still, mm-hmm. like it still does it in the same way and with the same frequency that it always used to. Mm-hmm. It's just that a heavyweight prospect tends to be a dude that just kind of comes out of nowhere and then maybe hits his peak ten years after he comes out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think if if you look at uh, and and I actually I did this I, I did this I think two years ago. Um, I went through and I looked at uh, and I looked weight class by weight class at like the top twenty five in, in every weight class and how long it took them to go from their first professional fight to uh, to competing in a major promotion, whatever that might have been at the time. And at heavyweight, it's like a year and a half less even than it, it, it it's like a year and a half less than it was for for middleweight. And light heavyweight was pretty comparable to heavyweight because guys do just come out of nowhere. You only need like five or maybe six wins. Or if you're Velasquez, two. 
Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. I mean, something you only need a couple of wins to get to the point where you where you can be competitive with the bottom of a, of a major promotions division. Like those those guys do tend to come out of nowhere. Like a, a, a heavyweight collegiate wrestler going into MMA is worth his, is worth his weight in gold because yeah. that guy's going to be in that guy's going to be in a major promotion in three fights. Definitely, definitely. But then the thing is, like, they might be in a major promotion in three fights or in five fights. But then, you know, when you actually predict the, like, you might be watching them for 10 years before you actually suddenly, you know, they're still a top 10 fighter. They might be in the top 20 for a decade and then suddenly be in a title shot. I yeah. mean, it's, it's... Oh, oh, my dog's whining at me, but like Fabricio Verdum, he made his prospect, his like real big debut as a prospect in 2006. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Against Antonio Nogueira, and he lost that fight, and then now we're talking about Fabrizio Verdum, heavyweight title shot. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, I, I do think you tend to see, I, I mean, I think there's an extent to which you see that, in, you see that in other weight classes, but certainly not as, uh, not as, not as much as you do at heavyweight, just because there's so many fewer guys, there's so many fewer opportunities for guys to get knocked off and fall down the, and fall down the ladder and the kinds of fighters who populate the bottom rungs of those divisions, I mean, you have to be shot, shot to lose fights to some of the to some of the basement dwellers at, at heavyweight and light heavyweight. Yeah. And so, you know, the kind of the kind of like losable fight that a that a former top welterweight might get just doesn't exist for a guy who still has any any modicum of skills at all at yeah. uh, uh, like at heavyweight or light heavyweight. Well, at the same point to that, I do think the light heavyweight is a terrible division that's suffering horribly, and I don't see any way forward for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, you you have the same problem that, at light heavyweight that you do at heavyweight in terms of there just not being that many big, relatively athletic, um, you know, skilled guys. Period. I mean, just yep. demographically, those those guys are hard to find, yep. especially when you, the UFC. And MMA in general tends to draw uh, draws a disproportionate number of its fighters from countries that are even smaller than Americans on yeah. average. So I mean, if you're if we're just looking at the bell curve of population distribution relative to height, I mean, you know, the average the average height of an Amer of an American male is you know five foot nine and a half or five foot. 10. In Brazil, it's like five foot seven and a half or five foot eight. Um, in Russia, I think in Russia, I think it's five foot eight and a half or five or, or five nine, something like that. And in the regions where the UFC draws most heavily and MMA draws most heavily in Russia, it's even smaller. Like in the Caucasus, it's, it's even smaller. Um, so if we're going to see more heavyweight or light heavyweight prospects, I think they have to come from Western Europe, where people are just bigger to start with. So the Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, Denmark. Um, yeah. I mean. The, to a certain extent, the UK, uh, because it, and those are also places where there's less competition for those guys' services athletically. Yeah. Than, you know, in the US, guys who are athletic guys who are six foot three and, and 230 pounds are going to play football, or they're going to play baseball, or they're going to play basketball, or they're going to play, they're going to do something that is not, you know, getting punched. makes a lot of money, actual, an actual a lot of money. <laughs> there's, there's just a huge market. I mean, if we think about the, if we think about it as a market for those guys' skills. Like there are a lot more competitors in the market for for Americans that size than there are for people from other yeah. countries. I mean, I I think the 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 thing that separates out light heavyweight as a bigger problem than heavyweight is that now light heavyweights are just cutting to middleweight because the cutting culture in MMA says that you will only be successful if you're at if you're cutting as much weight as you can possibly afford to. Yeah, I mean, there's a real thing about there's a real thing about. Uh, this idea of like margin for error in guys' heads that weight cutting is where they're going to make up that that tiny little that tiny little margin for error, and you know Dan Henderson is a really good example of is a really really good example of of how that culture has changed. Like mm -hmm. Dan Henderson starts fighting today, exact same exact same guy. He's a welterweight. Yeah, no question. Like he's he's cutting to he's cutting to 170. Maybe in his later career he moves up to 185, but Maybe, he's never yeah. a light, he's never a light heavyweight. Vanderlei no. Silva. Too. Vanderlei Silva is probably a big is probably a big welterweight or a or a small middleweight. Today. He probably would stay as a small middleweight. He was always pro pretty thick in the middle. Yeah. I, 
even at his and even at his youngest, smallest days, he was a pretty big dude. But he still, yeah, I mean, he would be a small middleweight, yeah. no question. Well, and I mean, like. If we're t- if we're talking about prospects at light heavyweight, the the, the prospect scene at light heavyweight is even thinner than it is even thinner than it is at, at heavyweight. I mean, it, it is, is yeah. it is a wasteland. I mean, like probably the second in terms of like record and you know doing impressive things, probably the second best light heavyweight prospect in the world right now is a guy named Alexei Butorin, a Russian guy, who literally has no idea how to defend a takedown. None. Yeah. Like literally. That has no idea how to sprawl, has no idea how to, has no idea how to limp leg and head pressure his way out of a single. Uh, has no bottom game, is just content to let his guard get past, and then maybe hopefully he stands up from side control. And we're talking like from the, from a skills perspective, that's a dude that you just never talk about if he's a lightweight or or, or a welterweight or a featherweight or literally any other weight class. But a light heavyweight, oh, yeah. it's like, oh, you know what? That that dude that probably works for him against bottom level light, light heavyweights in the UFC. Oh sure, sure. I mean, even like you know, you look at a guy like Blackowitz, who's now in his early 30s and like eight years into his career. I got, I think, and he's gonna pretty much walk right into the top 10 of the division. Yeah, because there's just nobody to stop him at all. Yeah. Like the, you know, and I mean, if you look at if you look at how old guys are, like. We're due for a major turnover at light heavyweight, and there's just nobody to replace them. Yeah, like, there's really there's nobody breaking into that top ten to really populate the bottom half of it. Because you know the top half of or the top five of every division is this like elite little cult almost of great athletes that turn over only very ever you know very so often. But the bottom half should be where you're getting a lot of churn. The, the yeah. bottom, the ten guys below that, that's where it, you should be seeing a lot of constant movement. And you got guys like Hendo and Shogun who have hung tough in there for forever. Yeah, I mean, a, a healthy functioning division should look like, light, or should look, look like, the, bo- the bottom half of the top ten should look like lightweight or welterweight. Yeah. Where you get pretty constant turnover. Like, you know, you look at lightweight over the last, uh, over the last year, uh, over the last year, year and a half, and you have guys like Donald Cerrone and Rafael Dos Anjos working their way up, and Eddie Alvarez and Eddie Alvarez is making statements about it, making trying to make statements and you know you get a lot of turnover and a lot of up and down movement and part of that is a function as a function of the fact that you have so many more fighters that you're putting on more fights anyway that yeah. just purely just purely as a function of uh, just purely as a function of frequency of competition you're going to get more movement there but that's what a healthy division looks like and light heavyweight doesn't look like that at all yeah i mean where you can even look at flyweight for you know a division that's the same size as light heavyweight for all means that you know purposes and fights just as often and we're already seeing a lot of movement in that division like that top 5 is a bit stagnant but the guys below that we're seeing a lot of sorting we're seeing a lot of guys that are about you know trying to contend for all those spots and have a chance at doing it yeah and and unlike light heavyweight there are good flyweight prospects out there that the UFC could that the UFC could sign and bring in and, and and make that division that much better. You know, like a guy like Sean Santella, mm-hmm. like not like a not a super awesome kind of fighter, but the kind of guy who really neatly slots into like the top fifteen or twenty of that division and and puts on some fun, entertaining fights. Or uh, like a guy I'm really high on one FC's flyweight champion Adriano Moraes. I don't think he sticks at flyweight long term. I think he's just too big to to keep making that cut. Uh, but but you know Adriano Moraes is is probably a is probably a top eight flyweight right now, and in two years is probably a top five flyweight if he can keep making it down. Um, you know this brings us to a question a question we got about uh, a, a fly a flyweight prospect named Pietro Menga. Now Menga is the living embodiment of a of a whole bunch of my pet peeves about uh, about prospects and pro- and the process of fighting in general because I hear people are really high on him. And you know what? I can see it based on based on his record. And if you look at his highlight reel, he's got he's got some impressive things on there. The problem is his game is really heavily predicated on playing off his back. Number mm-hmm. one, um, and number two, his game is really heavily predicated on the feet, on landing huge counter shots, on guys just leaving their chins out there after they throw a shot, and Mega kind of pops them with with a knee or or a big elbow or a big right hand, something like that. Um, and you know, neither one of the, the, that is literally the worst possible combination of skills that you could have to guarantee yourself long-term success 
uh, against against the world's best competition. Because you know what, you're just never going to submit John Dodson or Demetrius Johnson or or Joseph Benavides. You're never going to submit those guys off your back. It's never. No. Especially at Flyway 2, one of the big things about that division is that st- any any part of your game that depends on static ground, like time on the ground, is just not going to fly. Like, whether it's being great at working off your back or being great in top control, mm-hmm. there are very few Flyways who make either of those things work at all. Yeah, I mean, that's, like, out of all of the really impressive things about Demetrius Johnson's skill set, the ability to work top control for any extended period of time has to be among them for precisely that reason. I think that's a really good point. Uh, yeah. but so, there are you guys that can do it. Yeah, but so, you know, I think Menga, Menga, is, Menga is talented. I don't think anybody's going to dispute that. He's, he's got a really kind of interesting body type for the division. He's really long. Um, you know, he's, he's, obviously, he's obviously very skilled, the problem is, like, especially especially on the feet. I mean, I think you can get over the, the guard game thing, um, but, but on the feet, you're just never... I, you know, I went through and I watched a, a couple of his fights and I counted how many strikes he was throwing per minute. He's throwing four or five strikes a minute. And yeah. if you're throwing four or five strikes a minute on the regional scene, your output is almost always going to drop the second that you hit higher-level competition because they're not going to stand in range and let you hit them. Like, yeah. And so, you know, if he's throwing three or four strikes a minute... He just loses that decision every single time. Um, so I mean, that's that. That's you can even just you know you can even hold up Lyoto Machida as an example of that. Like yep. and Lyoto Machida's really good. He's yeah. really really good, and he still loses decisions on output. Yeah. So the you can, like output is one of those things that I mean aggression. It, that is that is like the great equalizer for underperforming talent is aggression. You, yeah. you can get the most talented fighters in the world that just don't th- they don't th- they don't throw enough they don't work enough. Yeah, Yoshihiro Akiyama, like sterling example of that, lost that fight to Jake Shields just purely by getting outworked. Uh, yep. Well, so, Jake Shields is the other. The, he's the perfect example of the other side of that. Has mm-hmm. won a ton of fights just by being busier and working harder. Yeah, and I, I mean, I don't have a problem with that. If the other guy, if you're throwing and the other guy's not throwing, you're winning. Like, I think that's, I think that's a perfectly reasonable kind of kind of way for judges to look at fights. It is, it is, definitely. So let's see what what are the so another thing that uh, somebody brought up: how bad is Canada at producing talent right now? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a valid concern. When you have a country of 35 million people, that's that that really is not producing, or that's producing less talent than you know similarly sized American states. Um, yeah, you know you've got to you've got to raise some you've got to raise some questions. I mean, I think a big part of it is just the, the utter stranglehold that TriStar has on all of the uh, the, the TriStar has on the prospect scene there. Mm. Uh, like any fighter, any Canadian fighter who's worth his salt is going to end up a, is is probably going to end up a TriStar. You know. Olivier Aubin Mercier has moved full. It looks like he's moved full time to TriStar. Elias Theodoru has moved has moved full time to uh, pretty much full time to TriStar. Uh, Chad Laprise has moved pretty much full time to TriStar. Rory McDonald is there. Um, you know, like they have really brought in just about every top Canadian fighter uh, to uh, to Montreal to, to Montreal to work with Sahabi. And that's you know, like that's not a critique of them for doing that. That's that it's it, that is a perfectly rational move to maximize their to maximize their chances of sticking around. Um, but you know, the problem is when you don't have a UFC caliber fighters who are off at other gyms, that lessens the amount of exposure that Canadian prospects can get. Um, that it, you know, like you think about everything that uh, like this is kind of a tangent, but you think about everything that like Uriah Faber has done for the, for the young alpha male guys. Just by being in a picture with them and tweeting it out, suddenly there's you know a few thousand more people who are aware of who like say Cody Garbrandt is, right? Yeah. Like if Cody Garbrandt's a dude at a random gym in Ohio, nobody's like nobody's ever heard of him. But now like you know you start to you start to build up a little hype around a guy who's five and zero and trains with and trains with some killers, and you know a guy like uh, that, that's not to say that you know Elias Theodoru is on the is on the level in terms of exposure as Uriah Faber, but like. You know that dude tweeting out a picture with and saying, "Oh yeah, this dude's gonna be awesome." Like, I think that hurts you a little bit in terms of in terms of getting to know those guys. But yeah, I mean, it's, what are your that's definitely. I, I think that's that's got to be part of it. And obviously, this whole thing with like uh, 
you know, the Canadian government of MMA has it's 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 a thorn that I just like I didn't expect, and I don't quite understand how it's put such a lockdown on a country that has generally been very good at producing talent. I think that that's got to be a big part of it too. I think that's true. I mean, you see the death of the the death of the Canadian regional MMA scene is a huge thing. Like, how long was score fight was score fighting around for? They were around for a long time, and they put on like they had great matchmaking. They put on a lot of great fights. Brought up a lot of guys from you know all the way from George St Pierre to Alex Garcia. All those guys fought and fought and score. Um, I don't know. Is ringside is ringside around anymore? I don't know. Yeah, I I don't I don't know the 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 small Canadian promotions nearly as well. I know that yeah. I mean I I don't I know that Heat's not. I don't think. And I mean MFC is more or less dead. I mean they went from putting on shows every couple of months to like three or four shows a year maybe. Yeah, like I I was I I've been surprised lately at how fa- fast they've fallen off. It just felt like even last year they were still putting on a fair number of shows, and then this year I've barely heard from them at all. It, it always comes up where it's like I'll I'll look at the weekend, you know, at, on Monday I'll look back at the fights that weekend. I'll be like, oh, MFC did a show. Yeah, that's I mean, weird. Zero zero buzz. I mean, and I think like in the case of MFC more than I mean I don't know what happened with uh, I don't know what happened with Score I, and. Like I, I don't know, I don't know why they're why they're not around anymore. But like, but with MFC, I think they just kind of fell behind the the general track of what promotions were doing in terms of attracting talent. I mean, their insistence on on exclusive contracts was a big part of it. Um, so like, uh, I, I mean, my my defining moment in terms of understanding like the the struggles of regional MMA fighters was when. Uh, I was tweeting about how stupid it was that MFC had these had these exclusive contracts and. MFC's PR guy tweets back at me, and he's like, no, actually, exclusive contracts are great for prospects. And I gave some just utter bullshit rundown of why, of why, he, why he thought that was the case. And he sounded like something out of a... Uh, yeah, I mean, it sounded like something out of a Koch Brothers PR meeting. Um, but, like, it was just, it was just crap. And he, or, or look at, like, Sam Alvey having to buy out his contract from MFC to go fight in the UFC. Yeah. Those are... Guys aren't going to sign with you if you're putting them under those kinds of restrictions and you're and you're blocking their path to get to where they actually want to go. No, definitely. I mean, we're we're already that's been become suddenly you know a huge problem with World Series of Fighting and a lot of the great prospects they've picked up is now suddenly you've got a whole bunch of guys whose careers are dead in the water. You mm-hmm. know, yeah. young guys. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, like Rick Glenn is a is a fantastic example of that. Uh, Rick Glenn beat the absolute hell out of Georgie Karakhanian to, to win World Series of Fighting's featherweight title. Um, is as far as I know, he's not injured. Uh, has not doesn't look like he's been offered a fight. I asked him the other day. I, I asked him the other day if he'd had a if he'd had a fight offer. He he said no. Um, you know, it took it took World Series of Fighting five months to offer Shaman Morais a fight uh, after they signed him in late May, early June. Um, you know, these are like they're they're killing guys' careers by not putting them out there. Yeah, and if you're like you really can't if you're a prospect, if you're somebody looking to get up in the sport quickly, like mm-hmm. there are only so many setbacks you can have before suddenly you're 30 and you've had 10 pro fights. Yeah, and and guys just guys will just fall off promoters' radars. Like yep. uh, like Nicholas Backstrom of uh, of getting knocked uh, knocked out by Mike Wilkinson fame on the last Sweden card. Yeah, uh, that that had to hurt your heart a little, didn't it? It you know I mean he shouldn't have yoked around so hard. He That's shouldn't all. have yoked around. That's all That's he all say, he say. says he's not yoking around. Wilkinson says you, he's yoking around. You are in fact yoking around. Yeah, leave, leave your leave your hands down at your waist while you're throwing a front kick and you overextend yourself into punching range like. That's just dumb on so many levels. Yeah. But, like, you look at Nicholas Backstrom when he was a prospect coming up, um, you know, he never fought more than twice a year, and promoter and promoters and matchmakers had kind of had, had kind of forgotten about him. Not, like, in the sense that, like, they didn't know who he was, but it was like, oh, is this guy really, like, actually doing this, or is he just kind of hanging out? Like, who, like, he didn't really have a profile to go with. 
and you always run that danger as a prospect. I mean, like it was it was a miracle that Baxter uh, that that whoever Ninamaki's opponent was for that uh, uh, for that for that Berlin card got hurt, and Backstrom happened to be in shape and and close. Yeah, because, no like, kidding. Otherwise, would Backstrom have ever ended up in the UFC? Maybe not. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's tough to tell. I mean, thank God we have Eastern Europe and Brazil who are still getting their young prospects like five fights a year yep. every year on the way up. Yeah, I mean, and like as far as I can tell, based on the kind of longevity research that I did, there's no evidence to suggest one to suggest that fighting four, five, six times a year as a prospect does anything negative for your for your ability to stick around for a long time. Well, no, I mean, it's one of the things that I, I've actually talked to a little bit about to people, too. And to my understanding, I mean, the idea is, like, it's like this idea that you get, you know, to, you know, not to be, like, really fatalistic, but let's say you get nine years as a top, as, like, a, a really strong pro career. Mm -hmm. That's, you're sort of, like, you get to be good for nine years, build up to come down. Those years aren't really like it doesn't really matter how often you fight in those nine years. It's really just about how much time you're in the gym, how much wear and tear you're taking yeah. training, how how much damage you do uh, training. So like yeah, maybe if you take two or three years off and you go to school or something and all that. Yeah, that'll change the outlook considerably. But if you're fighting once or twice a year, or if you're fighting four or five times a year, and you're still in the gym two or three times a day, six days a week, you're still doing basically the same damage to yourself. Yeah, the, this is yeah. I mean, I think there are a lot of misconceptions out there about when it actually is that fighter uh, that, that fighters take this damage that wears them down over the long term. And yeah, it's not by you know with with some exceptions if you have like a really brutal five round war yeah that's that's going to uh, that's going to do some damage over the long term but like for the most part it's the it, it's the 10 sparring session 10 really really hard sparring sessions you had leading up to the fight not the fight itself that's that's going to give you uh, that, that's going to uh, that might result in you know chronic uh, chronic brain injury and yeah things. so it's definitely one of those things where i i, I mean i'm looking at prospects coming up and I, you know you want to see guys fighting three or four times a year at least, just to like keep that progression going because they're get they're learning, they're in shape, they've got to be out there trying stuff and making stuff work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's it's really it's really about being in the gym and the fights are the the fights are like if you're fighting that often, then chances are you're in the gym, and so yeah. that's and so you're using that you're using the fact that they're taking regular fights. As a proxy marker for the, as a proxy marker for for the amount of time that they're spending actually training. Well, and, I mean, if the best example of that you can you can easily see the best example of that is Shane Carwin. Yeah. I mean, his career was like forty six minutes long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, you can't you can't sure. possibly claim that those forty six minutes damaged his longevity. No, huh? It was the, it was the hundreds of hours, hundreds or thousands of hours that he spent training at Grudge and hitting pads and sparring with uh, and sparring with Brendan Schaub and uh, uh, and Todd Duffy and guys like that. That's what that's what took it out of him. Very, very definitely. Let's see. Do we do we have anything else to talk about here? I'm looking. Um, somebody asked uh, what the best what we thought the best path for a prospect was. Uh, Picked up early by the UFC, either through tough or through just getting in early, going to Bellator or staying in the minors. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I would say that staying in the minors until you faced at least one or two really well-seasoned vets is usually the best path. But what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would say if you're if you're a prospect, stay away from the Ultimate Fighter. Uh, mm -hmm. Because there are so many there are so many variables involved with that. If you're living in a house and you don't have your coaches, and you're you may be fighting at not your natural weight, um, then that's and then leave, even even if you make it through all that and you end up and uh, and you make it to the final, you're going to get stuck with it. You're going to get stuck with just a terrible contract. Yeah, gonna, that's, that's like, definitely my view as well. Yeah, I mean it's going to be a millstone around your neck for ten fights until you. It, and in this sport, ten fights that could be four years. Yeah. Even more could be could be four could be five years before you're making actual money on a contract. I think I saw some data once that said like seventeen percent of UFC fighters fight more than twice a year. 
Yeah, I mean, it's just uh, it, you know, there's a, there's a lot of there are a lot of things that go into that, and at some point we should we should just have a whole chat about why is it that guys don't fight that often. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, that kind of contract, a ten fight contract, is gonna, uh, I mean, that's gonna hang with you for a long time. But I mean, I'm I'm definitely I, I'm with saying I think. I think best case scenario, if you're in Europe or you're in Russia, um, you know there aren't quite as many venues for this and uh, venues for this kind of thing in the United States. But yeah, you stick around on the regional scene. You have ten fights over th ten, a minimum of ten fights over th say three years, three and a half years. Um, in that kind of in that run by fighting uh, by fighting a UFC veteran um, who or kind of a regional journeyman, you get hooked up with an organization like Cage Warriors or M1. Um, maybe not M1, depending on how their contract structure yeah. works. Yeah, like Jungle stuff. Fights. Jungle Fights mm -hmm. is a great one. Yeah, Jungle Fights down in Brazil. You, some like a, an organization that has a defined track record of good matchmaking, of putting yes. guys, putting guys in fights where they're not going to be in over their heads, where they're going to be relatively evenly matched. Um, yeah, I mean, just where where the matchmaker knows what he's uh, what he's doing. And you see that, and, and you tend to see that with those kind of big, well-tenured, well-established organizations like M1 and Jungle Fights and Cage Warriors, uh, and and just stick around there. You don't, you don't necessarily. I mean, this would be a, a very different discussion if we were talking about old Bellator, because I would say never go there. Yeah. Uh, Scott Coker's Bellator. I think that's a you know if you if you're a prospect with leaning with uh, with violent leanings, I would say you could make yourself some money work, working for Scott Coker. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see. Uh, Michael Page in the UFC in a year. I mean, really? that wouldn't shock me at all. Really, I think he's. I think he's way more of a, a. I think he he has way more value to a promotion like Bellator than he does to the UFC. Yeah. In the UFC, he gets lost in the. It, he gets he he gets lost in you know the hundred other fighters at his weight. In Bellator, he's he's Michael fucking Page, the guy yeah. who can do crazy awesome spinning stuff, and you put his promo you put his promos out there before the card and. You know, guys like uh, guys like our good friend PDL on Twitter just lose their minds. You know, uh, violence connoisseurs tend to be big fans of Michael Page. Yeah, and I mean, he he could he could easily travel that Hector Lombard route on a sped up scale, where he goes into Bellator, he looks awesome, fights you know five or six or seven times, and then he's out the door. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's a for a guy like Page who has only been in the game for two and a half or three years, that's a perfectly viable path. And for for Michael Chandler too, you know Chandler's uh, Chandler's only been fighting for five years. Like those are guys who could who could have a two or three year stint in whatever the new Bellator ends up being, and could still come out with one or two big contracts left waiting for them on the other side if they if they handle their business right. It's yeah, that's true. It it, it really does depend on the new Bellator and how. How, how how entrapping they are. It, it seems like, I mean, Coker's history is to be a very fighter-friendly uh, promoter, so I would assume that it'll be less, but of course it could all be down to the Viacom pressure too and whether they, uh, you know, feel like the competitive necessities of the marketplace mean that they have to work as hard as they can to keep as many people as possible. Yeah, and, you know, I think, I would like to think, that because I think you're absolutely right. That is a that is a, a distinct possibility. I would like to think that when you have a matchmaker as talented as Rich Chu is, that uh, that you're going to trust in your ability to find new upcoming guys. That yeah. you know when when guys like uh, when guys like Page and Chandler end up as end up as free agents when they fight out their contracts. You know you make them you make them an offer based on what your their value is to your promotion. And if that doesn't match the UFC's offer, then no big deal. Like yeah. you've won yourself a reputation with those kinds of up-and-coming fighters as somebody who's going to be reasonable and isn't going to try and isn't going to try and and keep you when you don't want to be there. Yeah, and that it too. Like you can create the kind of channel where you're always getting exciting fighters because they know that they can travel through and, and come out the other side better than they came in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. you're going to match them fairly. You're going to put them in fights that you're going to put them in fights that highlight their talents. Uh, you're going to you're going to promote them. You're going to promote them, the fighter, yeah. not the brand, not the promoter. Like, I mean, I, yeah. I actually just had a weird thought. We could be seeing a, a space in in six months. There could be zero promotion at the like. There could be very few promotions at the regional level that can give you a lot of exposure. I mean, 
we have RFA and we have Legacy, and those are the two big channels to the UFC. But those aren't like they aren't getting they aren't spotlighting fighters nearly to the extent that Bellator does. Yeah, I mean, and you you know, we saw uh, to a certain extent we saw the old Strike Force do this. They could they could pick up guys really early in their really early in their careers, stick them on undercards like Luke Rockhold. Is a, is a good example of that. That like, and because you don't have any pressure to put like a real great product on uh, on for your undercard, you can match those do you can match those kinds of prospects up with local jobbers. Yeah, and and that's perfectly fine because nobody is expecting a certain quality of product from your online streamed prelims on Spike.com. Very but very true. That that works out just fine for you. Um, but so maybe so maybe we see that. I, I agree with you that the the kind of the U.S. regional the the, ramp, the landscape of like regional promotions in the U.S. is is changing pretty drastically, and I don't think we know what the the end product is going to look like. I'm just no. you know as as much as we we joke about all of the all of World Series of Fighting's giant screw ups, I'm just not sure there's a place for a promotion like that in, anymore. No, you can't really run one. Well, I mean, has there ever been? That's sort of the problem. Is like. They, I mean, World Series of Fighting did a great job of just like following the well hallowed ground of being a promotion that does enough things wrong that they're dead within two years. <laughs> it is, it is that is hallowed and well traveled ground indeed. I mean, like it's they don't like I don't think the sad part is for World Series of Fighting when they inevitably go under in the near future, they don't even merit a tombstone in Dana no. White's office. They're not even important enough to deserve a tombstone. Like, no, they're not. Like. You know, here is speaking of speaking of prospects to, to keep this on our to keep this on our main theme. If if you're Viacom and you have a couple of million dollars lying around, wouldn't it be worth it to buy World Series of Fighting just for the roster? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, you can you could even just you know take only the young fighters out of the roster and shuck the rest, and you'd still be it'd still be a worthwhile investment. Yeah, I mean, when you're talking about it. When you're talking about Justin Gagey, uh, Marlon Moraes, Rick Glenn, um, like uh, Shaman Moraes. Oh yeah, Shaman Shaman Moraes. And if you uh, could get Tyrone Spong out of it, Timur Timur Valiev at bantamweight, like they have really built a nice roster of fight. Oh, Lance Palmer also. Yep. Um, they have a really nice roster of fighters that they've developed, and collectively. Those guys are those guys are are worth more than are, are like, I, I mean it would, it's almost to the point where it would be worth it that if that promotion looked like it was going to go under, it would almost be worth it for the UFC to buy it just to get those guys. Oh yeah, well it would it would it would almost yeah it would just about be worth it to the UFC too. It would certainly be worth it for Bellator, but mm -hmm. I mean where I it it all it does already seem like they're trying to slowly shop off just enough guys to stay afloat. So we'll yeah. see whether that turns into a fire sale at some point. Well, apparently, apparently they did sign some sort of international TV deal, so they so they they are now actually gaining revenue from uh, from from broadcasting fights, which is not a thing that they were doing before. Yeah, well, that that'll be interesting to see if that keeps them afloat going forward. That it, that may barely avoid the death knell unless it just collapses. You know, I mean, that's the sort of thing that you're like, oh man, that's great news, and then they're still gone three months from now. And, well, I don't. I don't know if you saw this earlier today, but they are now. Uh, World Series of Fighting is now uh, off the pay per view plan. Apparently, not not just ditching the revenue sharing model, but they're just not going to do pay per view in general. Fooled you. Yeah. Well, that's that's actually good news. That means they actually have some eye to sticking around for another <laughs> two or three years. Uh, yeah. There's not, nothing better than an ill advised than an ill advised pay per view. Yeah, I mean, if even Bellator had a very successful MMA pay-per-view debut, and they were just turned around, and looked at it, and said, "Okay, no, we're never doing that again," <laughs> then you've got to you've got to understand just how bad that pay-per-view market is. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, yeah. But I think anyway, we are slowly slowly drifting a field, so I think we've kind of run the course on our topics. But um, thank you for coming by and talking prospects and development and you know, failing and winning and all, all the sort of things that go into expecting a guy to do well in the regional scene and then him act, er, doing well from the regional scene and then actually seeing him find some level of success in the UFC. Good to have you on. Hey, thanks very much for having me, Zane. It was a good chat.
No problem. And of course, this is uh, you know, if you watched this and liked it, you should thumbs up it, like it on uh, YouTube, and uh, follow MMANation.com, and you can find me at Zane Simon and over on Bloody Elbow on, and you can find Pat at Patrick Wy- Patrick underscore Wyman, and, and uh, on Sherdog.com. Yeah, and I'll have a I'll have another prospect piece coming out in the next couple of days, so keep an eye out for that. All right, cool. Thanks for stopping by.